I got a letter from the government the other day. I opened and read it and burned that. Man, the way that I live don't concern that. Man, we gon' have to settle this another way. A letter from the government. Welcome to another edition of Critical Insight on Your World News. I'm your host, Solomon Kamajan. And once again, it's our honor to be joined by Callie Akuno of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. And uh, if you remember about a few months back, we had Brother Callie on to discuss the uh, 2012 report that they released in, uh, I believe it was uh, late June, early July, um, about uh, every uh, 36 hours an African, a black person was killed in America by the police, law enforcement, or so-called uh, law enforcement and security guards. And we have Cali on today to discuss a recent report to that, um, following up the, the, their initial report that discloses the entire calendar year of 2012 um, Every 28 hours now, uh, a black person was killed by the police, a total of, of 313 at the very, very least um, by the police. And so we have Callie on again to, to discuss this uh, report, to discuss the, um, the most recent support and r report and its ramifications. And uh, Callie, I'd like to welcome you on Critical Insight again. And just to start off by asking you if you can give folks, especially folks that may have not have uh, um, seen the first interview, may have not seen uh, your other interviews that you've done on uh, programs like uh, the Real News Web Network, may not have even uh, heard of the report or read the report. What did the first report disclose and, and why the second report? What, what's the difference between the first and second report? Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is the third report, actually, oh. just so folks know. Uh, we did, uh, myself and Harlan Eisen uh, collaborated uh, uh, to produce the first two, and the first one came out in March, and that one highlighted that there were, at that point, uh, more than 30 uh, black people killed, primarily black men, uh, between the ages of 18 and I think like 32, that time that we were looking at. Uh, and we were putting this together uh, uh, right at the, the kind of the height, if you will, of, of uh, a lot of the mass mobilization that was going on around Trayvon Martin's uh, killing uh, by George Zimmerman, uh, and we were putting this together, not necessarily because of that, uh, but we were putting it together because we had just noticed a spike uh, at the end of 2011, 2012, and we're really following up on some initiatives that we started to pay attention to in 2008 to just bring you know all the uh, uh, the folks who are watching this uh, up to date. When MXGM put out a short piece around uh, three brothers who were two were killed, one was critically injured. Uh, New Year's Eve of 2008-2009. And what we were anticipating uh, then and had begun monitoring uh, was that uh, in part because of the, re the racist reaction uh, to uh, uh, the first person of African descent uh, being elected to the President of the United States, that there was going to be an increase in this kind of uh, 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 hostility towards uh, black people, towards African people in this country. Um, and as far as we can tell, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to why I say that. As far as we can tell, there's definitely been uh, a spike. And so we wanted to really highlight that. Uh, and that first report came out in March. We then followed up three months later uh, as the page just kept advancing uh, based on the research that, that we were doing. Uh, and what we came up with uh, was that there were 120 uh, black people who had been killed primarily by the police, but some by... Uh, security officers who were uh, police primarily who were moonlighting uh, doing kind of private contract work uh, and uh, uh, vigilantes if you will uh, many of whom were deputized to do certain services in their communities uh, by local police forces as it was the case with, with uh, Zimmerman. So we really wanted to highlight this. We wanted to highlight it to bring it to A, the black community's attention but also the attention of the world that a major human rights crisis was occurring and that you were hearing very little about it. And there was uh, next to nothing being done about it uh, by the, the, the U.S. government, who has the primary responsibility uh, to control this, but since it's, it's their operatives, if you were their employees, uh, who are responsible for these killings. And so uh, we wanted to highlight this fact and bring it to everybody's attention. It's kind of a wake-up call. Callie, can you tell us what uh, methodology you and your uh, colleagues and comrades that Malcolm X Grassroots Movement used to to uh, to compile the data that went into all three reports. 
the basic methodology uh, was combing through uh, the mainstream media reports about individuals who had been killed, uh, police reports uh, of the same individuals who had been killed, uh, and then doing a lot of cross-referencing of uh, their names, their race, uh, the factors and, and circumstances surrounding uh, their deaths, uh, and doing, you know, just kind of a cross-referencing to make sure we had as much information uh, as was possible uh, available. And this last one, uh, let me tell you, uh, uh, the, the person who did the research on it and put the, 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 the report uh, fundamentally together uh, was Comrade Ar Arlene Eisen, who uh, put countless uh, hours into uh, cross-referencing, checking all this information, uh, making sure all the data was uh, uh, correct, uh, following up with, with leads, uh, parceling out information where, where there were some tough cases. Uh, but it was basically, you know, those two, the police reports and the mainstream media uh, that we had to rely upon because, again, outside of kind of your, your FBI uh, statistics, uh, which are increasingly becoming more and more, quote-unquote, race uh, neutral in their reportage, uh, it's really kind of hard to ascertain a lot of this information. Uh, and it's been in their uh, interest, really, and part of the, the kind of the right-wing agenda uh, to kind of disaggregate, not, not do any disaggregation of information by race, etc., uh, to kind of paint just a very distorted picture of uh, where the main thrust of the state's attacks and aggression is. So uh, really trying to highlight that information is a critical uh, piece. And I think it's also, uh, uh, so that, that's the primary method. And I know some people, just to back up, some people have been, been asking us, you know, uh, they want a list of all the, the websites and everything. And literally that would be thousands of websites. We encourage folks to, if you want to go collaborate or, or uh, 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 check the data for yourselves, by all means do, you know, look at the names, right. uh, look at the circumstances and do your research on it. And you'll find that, uh, you know, it's there to a T. Um, and one of the things that uh, you will also find is that uh, more than likely there are more than 313 cases. I think we talked about this, this earlier, but those are the ones that we could uh, substantially validate. And we know that there are more out there. Uh, but that the way that the reporting is done primarily by the police and then how the mainstream media really just tells and copies and accepts everything pretty much the police put out without any critical questioning. Uh, you have some police departments like Philly, like Detroit, like Chicago, which make it very, very hard, extremely hard and intentionally hard to kind of gather a lot of information. So what we often have to do is kind of cross-reference uh, when we hear it was something, an incident happened in a certain neighborhood or a certain locale, kind of cross-reference that with like census data and things of that nature to kind of get a sense, okay, who's who, you know, what are the circumstances, what's what, to be a little bit more revealing than what the police uh, had intended. Um, but it brings again the question that we've been, been drawing out that uh, there has to be some, uh, uh, whether uh, the movement takes this on or the state takes this on, I think both need to happen. But, you know, there is no uh, source right now that is compiling this information, compiling this, uh, uh, this data. And uh, it's critical that we have it because uh, it will reveal the deeper natures of the police state and the, and the nature of the repression uh, which is taking place uh, throughout this country. Uh, so if you look at the specific things we've, you know, focused specifically uh, uh, not exclusively, but, but very specifically on the African community, the black community in this country. But we know that overlaps with, quote-unquote, the Latino community in many cases, right, with Dominicans, or Haitians, uh, et cetera, uh, other people from the West Indies, et cetera. Um, and what we put out, we said, in, a, in I think the last interview we did, we know for a fact that if you look at the casualties around some of the different things happening on the border, primarily with Mexico, uh, and how that whole zone has been uh, militarized, militarized. There's been all this uh, legislation that's, been, that's passed through Congress and all these executive orders, which now allows uh, uh, anybody within kind of a 100 or 50 mile radius, I think one of the two, uh, if you're within that radius, you can be stopped, searched, and, and checked without a warrant, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's some very, you know, the, the nature of the repression, I think, is becoming much more acute, but because 
many of us are looking at or, or trying to look at it in its totality of how we're playing out, we kind of see it in isolated ways. Yeah. And what we want to push is to everybody that you got to look at it in a integrated way to understand the truly repressive nature of the society and where it's going and where it's heading and what we need to do to kind of defend ourselves uh, uh, on a practical level to, to confront it and stop it. Right, right. And speaking of oppression, when you look at, um, you know, for instance, the, uh, the white supremacist, capitalist, uh, institutionally racist nature of, of the media in this country, and obviously that spills over to uh, um, the nature of policing uh, in, in the United States of America, um, we know that, that public policy oftentimes is, is, is predicated on, on a number of things, and some of those things have to do with the way uh, the media portrays um, various things such as such as crime and, and uh, your organization named after Malcolm X to paraphrase him he, he said one time that uh, that the the newspapers will have you uh, hating the oppressed and and sure. and, and loving the the oppressor, the oppressor. Um, w with that being said have you um when you were you know just kind of fleshing through um, I, I can only imagine thousands and thousands of probably tens of thousands of pages of, 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 of newspapers and, and periodicals to, to, to put the, these three reports together. Did you find that there was a common thread where, where the, the, the media, uh, these newspapers were, were uh, I guess the best way to say it, were casting uh, doubt over the, the victims and, and they, were, they were giving, you know, they were basically giving benefit of the doubt to, to the police officers. And then the second part of that question, when you were looking through that, did you find anything about how the police officers justified their uh, excessive force in relationship to these uh, extrajudicial uh, murders and killings that they conducted? Right. Good question. Glad you asked. Um, I would say 99.9% of the media coverage just tailors, you know, what the police reports issue to the media. And what the circumstances are, uh, that's the lead, that's the kind of the ground cover. Where there's some questions or things of doubt, it usually comes from a family member who they've interviewed, uh, who will raise a point about uh, this not being just. They want information. Some of the facts don't add up. Uh, you know, uh, my son or daughter, uh, you know, uh, is not involved in certain types of activities. Uh, and then the media will say, you know, well, there's community members who uh, want answers or who raise certain questions. And that's it. They believe that that's kind of a balanced coverage or balanced information. And rarely, if ever, did we encounter uh, in any of these three reports, uh, you know, a, a real effort by uh, uh, these kind of beat journalists to do their own independent investigation. You know, uh, so it's just really whatever the police put out, you know, give me your facts release. I'm going to just tell it out, maybe get one or two other quotes from somebody else to make it look more objective and neutral. You know, how the, the mainstream media and how we're all taught in journalism, those of us who go through those kind of courses or even taught in your basic English classes. You know, be objective. and That's what they consider objectivity. Uh, and, you know, rarely is anything presented from the black community's perspective around, uh, you know, why are there so many uh, uh, stops and frisk in our neighborhood? You know, uh, why is my neighborhood uh, uh, designated a high crime area or, or a high drug trafficking uh, uh, area uh, when anyone who knows anything about drug consumption in the United States knows that uh, that is primarily concentrated in the white community, always has, and, and more than likely, unless there's some major demographic shifts, mm -hmm. always will be. Right. But our communities are policed and targeted in a very specific uh, manner, mm -hmm. which is completely out of proportion to the reality of that's what they're trying to do is confront uh, drug use, drug sales, and, and drug, you know, uh, uh, the promotion of the paraphernalia and, and targeting the activities, supposedly criminal activities that go with it. It's totally out of proportion to. Uh, what the reality is of, of both use uh, uh, and then distribution in this country. So uh, the targeted ways uh, and the targeted policies uh, and the laws that are unbalanced, like the, the, the cocaine to, to crack uh, disparity, 
are very much rooted in white supremacy, very much rooted in the, the unequal order of this society, and uh, who is easy to criminalize, who is easy to target, uh, without causing too much of commotion, too much of a ruckus. Uh, but the main thing that you know we uh, uh, in this report, you know, uh, I think the tables in particular that that uh, uh, will come up. I want to draw everybody's attention to really look at the categorization uh, that is there and the information that is there and how we try to break it out. And I think get this new one. Uh, Arlene added a couple of different things if you look at it from from the first two reports to the third one that I think were very uh, helpful. Uh, uh, and for us to kind of think further about this is taking the information apart that's presented to us by the, by the police and then putting a critical historical lens, you know, sh shaped and fashioned by our community and our experience to be like, okay, uh, y'all lying. We know, it, you know, <laughs> policing don't go down like this. We know not everybody has a weapon. We know that uh, 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 you can't claim someone as being aggressive, but then shoot them in the back. You know, we, it, it's just too much things that you can just right. tease out of even their information. Yeah. Uh, to know that, you know, I would say roughly 90% of these are just straight up, you know, cover-ups for uh, their, uh, uh, for the policies and practices that they're, that they're pursuing. And just how they're trained. They say it this way, don't say it that way, and you'll be covered. You know, uh, uh, and should you not uh, should the stories not add up, don't worry about it. We have, uh, you know, the, the, the mayor more than likely will get our back. You know, if not the mayor, then the, 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 the courts will get our back. So, uh, you know, they're under no real pressure or threat, save for what we organize as a community and put on them to be accountable in some particular form or fashion. So, um, but it's critical to take for, for, for folks to understand uh, how this information is used uh, by our enemies uh, to justify their policies, to justify the repression. And that's the key thing that we're trying to counter with these reports, you know, because they're going to try to use uh, what we've seen, particularly since uh, September 11th, they will use every little incident to their advantage if we let them to come up with more repressive measure, measures, you know, at every turn. So, you know, we've, we've been doing this interview post the, the incidences in Boston, and you're already here, you know, mm -hmm. even there, uh, despite whatever happened, if, you know, I'm, you know, we got to raise serious questions about this case, if it's not one of these mm -hmm. more elaborate FBI entrapment scenarios going, going crazy, which it may be, well be, uh, we have to hear that out, but regardless of whether it's something they set up or not, the response, uh, is already tightening the noose. You know, we need to spy on more uh, 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 Arabs and Muslims. You know, it's coming out the mouths of, of the Republicans and some Democrats and, you know, spy completely, even more so than they've been doing already since September 11th. You know, they need to come up with more surveillance programs and drones and things of that nature, you know, that they want to put into the equation. Uh, you know, and, and on and on and on, you know, uh, labeling people as enemy combatants or, or labeling them as terrorists, not having, you know, their Miranda rights and people, you know, praising this and thinking it's justified. Um, you know, so these are some things that we definitely have to pay attention to because people are being conditioned. I mean, that's the critical thing. What happened in Boston, you know, this whole siege, if you accept that, then you accepting, you know, the fundamental premise of a police state and how... Uh, uh, this whole thing has been built out, rolled out, and those are some of the things we've been trying to draw attention to, that this whole militarization of the so-called domestic space within the United States, it's been going on for 40 years. It took a major turn in the 90s, but, you know, you now have little armies in every single major urban uh, 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 city uh, where the police operate basically with impunity like they do in Iraq or Afghanistan and using the same toys and the same weapons and the same strategies and tactics of counterinsurgency and, and containment on black and brown communities. So uh, it's very critical that we look at, again, try to look at all this in a, in a complete perspective and, and use the information as tools in our organizing to fight back against what they're trying to push. Right. Right. Thank you. And this report, this most recent report they re released within the last two weeks, 
uh, Operation Ghetto Storm. Um, I can remember the, the, the first time, you know, that we interviewed you uh, a few months ago, um, a lot of the, uh, well, not a lot, but all of the corporate media in, in the U.S. had not, uh, had virtually ignored it, uh, suppressed it, if, if you will. Um, and also the, the so-called progressive media, a lot of the, the folks who had been, um, you know, considered progressive media uh, weren't picking up this story. Has the, with this particular report, has the, the uh, media coverage, has it increased, has it decreased, has it, you know, pretty much been a status quo? Um, it's pretty much been the status quo. Uh, and in point of fact, to this point, uh, as you pointed out, it's only been, you know, uh, publicly released for a little bit more than, I think, two weeks now. Um, it, it, it's hardly gotten any coverage. I mean, I think the piece that the Real News Network has done, uh, the piece that was on Black Agenda Report and a couple of blogs that has been on, uh, like Rania's and some other folks, and that's really the extent to which it's received any kind of noted coverage at this point. Uh, and it's not because uh, uh, we haven't reached out to the progressive or the mainstream capitalist media. Uh, we've reached out to them several uh, different times, uh, and there's largely been kind of a, a either a more of the same attitude or a total disregard uh, for the report and its findings, uh, you know, altogether. Uh, and quite honestly, uh, it's not something that, uh, at least to myself, um, that I find that surprising. You know, uh, because the, the the reality of it is the silence, again, speaks uh, to the lack of value that African life, the black life has in this country. Uh, and that's, I think, pretty much across the board. Uh, uh, even a lot of uh, uh, black outlets that you would think would pick up something like this uh, have also kind of uh, uh, ignored it. Some because I think they fear uh, what the implications might mean uh, for the Obama administration. And many of them are still... Uh, um, trying to defend him against uh, the kind of the racist criticism that he is coming under, but also uh, not trying to rock the boat in terms of uh, really challenging his uh, uh, politics and his policies that he's been putting out. So uh, we're not that surprised, but we're going to keep plugging along because the information has to get out there. Uh, we encourage everybody who, who uh, is watching your show or some of the others uh, that have picked us up to download the report. And more importantly, uh, spread it word of mouth. I mean, we got to just use the, the tried and true that we know in the black community uh, is, you know, word of mouth and hand to hand is often the most reliable way we get information anyway. It's not filtered or distorted, uh, particularly by mainstream media uh, and its biases against African people. Right. I appreciate that. Um, I've heard you speak before, um, you know, very eloquently and, and in a very detailed manner connecting the dots between uh, racism, white supremacy, uh, capitalism, and you just mentioned the, the, the capitalist uh, uh, mainstream media in this country. Um, when we talk about that, can you talk about the, the, the underground economy, which you've discussed before? And, uh, you know, because you have some folks that will come out and say, hey, you know, Callie, well, why don't you put out a report about uh, the, the structural violence that include that, that, uh, that, um, that happens within uh, black and brown communities, you know, the so-called black and black violence, brown and brown violence. Why don't you discuss that? Right. Cities like Chicago. Uh, what, what's your response to that? And, and how do you connect that to capitalism and, and mm -hmm. the underground economy, which you've discussed before? Mm -hmm. Number one, we always try to, try to point out that the two are intimately linked, that the violence that you see, uh, intercommunal violence that you see, particularly in the black community, is very much tied to the underground economy. It's very much tied to uh, competition over uh, kind of corner markets, if you will, small time markets, if you will, uh, and the intensity of controlling the drug trade, the sex trade, uh, the trade in illicit goods, you know, other goods and services that are part of the underground economy. Uh, and how they're linked is directly through uh, the government structuring uh, of these economies. Uh, and why do I say that? If we look at particularly the, the, the drug uh, markets and the, the, uh, the drug game, if you will, uh, that is uh, an international circuit of capital that we are intimately tied to. And if you just take the, primarily the, the dominant product on that market, which is cocaine, be it in its raw form or its powder form or, or uh, its kind of crack form, uh, you got to recognize how uh, the corner uh, blocks in Chicago are tied to the economies of the Andean region, 
you know, to Colombia, to Peru, to Bolivia, to Ecuador, and the cocoa that's being produced there, uh, the nature of which the United States government is financing campaigns uh, and, and wars, uh, counter-revolutionary wars in all those countries, how they use Colombia as a kind of a primary uh, 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 bulwark or, or security guard, if you will, similar to the role that Israel plays uh, over in uh, Southwest uh, uh, Asia, uh, where they arm it to the teeth. Uh, they've been sponsoring and, and facilitating a, a counter, what they call a counter insurgency war against uh, left forces there uh, that have uh, also, in some respects, deeply got, got involved uh, in this economy because of how lucrative it is. And if you look at all the violence that's taking place in Mexico, which is the main hub by which, you know, cocaine is uh, introduced now, that is, a, you know, we are directly tied to that, whether we're in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Boston, Atlanta, wherever, we're linked into that circuit of capital. And uh, because uh, how the drug war is structured, not only within the United States, but internationally, uh, violence is part and parcel of the game. You know, uh, it's part and parcel of how the whole economy is, is both mediated and regulated. Uh, and because the United States government, uh, for a number of different reasons, refuses uh, to acknowledge that the drug war is a complete and utter failure. But, you know, it also, I think we have to keep in mind, uh, it's better for business to have a perpetual war than it is to resolve a conflict. Uh, so that's something we also got to keep in mind as part of the calculus. Uh, but it's not something that, that I would argue, let me put it this way, I would argue that if you look at mass incarceration and if you look at the, the casualties of the drug war, it's, it's doing what it was designed to do, which is destabilize entire communities and nations uh, throughout the, the globe and to keep certain forces uh, and the ruling class in power. So in that regard, it's very successful. As regards to our lives, uh, you know, it's doing the damage to keep us divided, to keep us fragmented. Uh, and I think that's part of the objective that we really need to, to, to highlight and focus on. So what we always say, and what you can see in the, the more so in, the, the, in this report in Operation Ghetto Storm, we really tried to make that much more explicit than it was in the first two uh, reports. But we also, within the, the Let Your Model Be Resistance, try to address that in, in that, this question of uh, how do we deal with intercommunal violence uh, by pointing out the links and encouraging folks not to take kind of a static view, but to take a more comprehensive and a global view uh, on this question and see how and understand how we are linked and ultimately how we're going to have to fight back, uh, 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 you know, to stop this type of destabilization and containment that's being visited amongst us because it's not going to be solved purely within the U.S. context. This is something that uh, we are going to have to, to, to analyze, I mean, organize with on an international basis uh, with folks throughout Latin America. Brother Kyle, can you continue um, to expound upon what you were talking about in, term, in regards to the underground economy and, and how the structures of capitalism, you know, force folks to turn to this underground economy because there's no jobs whatsoever mm -hmm. within their communities. And, and we find that most of these communities that are um, riddled with unemployment and, and a lack of opportunity happen to be right. communities that are predominantly black and brown. That's right, that's right. So yeah, just continuing, you know, I think the, the critical thing is that, that uh, we have to really look at, examine, and study, uh, and it is, it's very relevant to our campaign work around uh, drug policy changes, some of the drug laws, uh, the, the disparities in sentencing between uh, powder cocaine and crack cocaine, uh, that we are tied to uh, an international circuit of capital, uh, very much controlled by the United States government. Um, you know, we look at the, the, the drug game, you know, uh, in particular, uh, and, and, and cocaine as one circuit of it, which has its, its primary root and base start in the Andean region, uh, and how much that is a central part of the economy in places like Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, uh, and now increasingly in Mexico, you know, uh, with, with the cartels there and all the violence that's been going on there. And you bring that same dynamic uh, from the same type of, uh, of disarticulated economy uh, that operates on a global scale. And you put that in the communities of Atlanta. You put that right hard in the black community of, of Chicago, New York, Detroit, Boston, Baltimore, D.C., you name it, right? We are directly tied uh, uh, to each other. Uh, in a very symbiotic and often kind of a parasitic relationship to each other. Uh, so we have to kind of put that in mind when we're thinking about, well, how do we really uh, address both 
uh, this issue of kind of mass incarceration, uh, the extrajudicial killings that are that are part of uh, the whole militarization and aggressive and, and you know uh, occupation of black and brown communities by the police throughout the country, uh, and how do we deal with you know the issues of racial profiling? Many people always want to kind of put this, you know, we can just come up with these kind of local solutions and. Until you deal with the economic root, you're not going to deal with, with uh, uh, you know, the fundamental basis of why there is so much violence uh, in the black community, why there is so much violence in, in Mexico, why there is so much violence in uh, Colombia, you know, Peru, and in the Andean region. Uh, all three of us, are, you know, all those, as, that's just one circuit, the others, you know, going to heroin or going to, uh, you know, marijuana, there's all different types of uh, circuits that, a lot of our people, because of the very unemployment uh, and the structural, I would call it displacement that black people face in this country, particularly in the economic realm, have been confronted really since the end of the 1960s. Uh, you know, uh, working in the underground economy is, is, is one way or another. Either people are permanently uh, uh, in that wing, growing numbers of our people, or some you, know, you we all, to a certain extent, uh, uh, are trying to make ends meet by engaging some some aspect of, of that economy. It could be from just barter with your neighbors or your friends or your family, or or getting goods and services, you know, uh, gratis and in, in exchange. You know, watch my kids, I watch yours. You know, all these are things that are, are a part of this kind of this this uh, uh, cycle and circuit of capital. It's hard to kind of trace, but it's very real in our lives and has an impact and it has a very different impact in terms of uh, the intercommunal, the black-on-black -black violence that we see, and they're directly related. Right. You know, uh, uh, that's the main point that we really want to bring home to folks who want to kind of throw out, well, how can you, uh, these numbers pale in comparison to what's going on, uh, say, in Chicago, uh, per se. Uh, and if you look at them in isolation, that's true. But if you look at them in uh, directly connected, you find that... Uh, uh, overall, and what we've been trying to point out is that, you know, this is a, a, a systematic uh, assault on black life in this country. And the extrajudicial killing is one particular component of it, and it's an egregious component of it that is, uh, you know, the hand of the state is clear, right? It's not in the background with letting, you know, drug shipments come through or gun shipments come through or it's very direct and it's very clear, and we got to give it focus because it, it helps us to understand the overall character of the, of the nature of the assault that's against our people. That's right. And looking at the, the within the flesh um, and the meat of, of this uh, extensive report, can you tell us um, what is the largest age demographic of Africans who were killed by these police or so-called law enforcement? Those in their prime, the young, mm -hmm. you know, uh, basically... Roughly, but I would say that the vast majority eight, between the ages of 18 and, and 30. You know, uh, some of our most productive physical years, uh, the years that, uh, you know, uh, one would think in a, a, in a, a more uh, uh, humane society and economy, uh, that people will be putting in uh, quality work, kind of refining their educational skills uh, uh, and enhancing uh, you know, getting out and exploring the world, uh, uh, learning themselves, you know, uh, starting to become uh, uh, more concrete contributors to the economy and to the society, becoming parents. Uh, but people who uh, should have, you know, uh, in our quote-unquote modern society, should have, you know, 40 to 50 productive years of their life ahead of them. Yeah. And that's being snatched and being stolen, and that has a profound impact on what the future of our communities are going to look like. Uh, you know, if you take uh, that many young men and, and women, uh, you know, either off the street because they're incarcerated or you just outright killed them, uh, that's going to have a profound impact on the generations, you know, uh, uh, coming behind us. And that's one of the things also is the message we've been trying to get out, you know, uh, is for folks to really look at, you know, what is the future going to entail uh, with this space of, of, of assault against our people. And Callie, the, the next question I'd like to ask you is, um, can you talk about um, what percentage of the cases um, excessive uh, force was used? Because I know that's documented within the report. It, it, it details like, um, I think it was something like 86% of the cases were, were excessive. Can you expound upon that? 
Well, again, let's, let's, I want to bring folks back to the methodology. Um, and what we were really trying to bring out of that is, even in their own reports, uh, the extent of the, 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 the violence, let's just break it down to that, the violence that they were willing to meet out uh, in all of these cases. And so how are they being trained? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, who's supervising them? You know, how, uh, uh, is enough enough? Yeah. But what you clearly see is that, uh, you know, people want to, who may be detractors against the information that's compiled, detractors against the report, detractors against the analysis. The critical piece around that figure and those statistics in general is that, you know, it shows a very clear pattern. That this is not just isolated. These methods, right, these strategies and tactics that they're using in, for the policing of our communities, they're not isolated. You know, it's not like the people in, in Seattle are getting necessarily a different training than the people in Atlanta. You know, the police officers in Atlanta or those in, in Boston are getting a different orientation than those in Los Angeles. Because people want to point to this fragmented, you know, oh, well, each kind of police is, you know, department is a little bit different or the context is a little bit different or they get trained in different ways and, and some are more accountable or then you get there's good cops and there's bad cops, you know, and we weren't really wanted to bring home. It's like, okay, well, you know, uh, in the quantified world that we live in, uh, if numbers don't lie, how do you justify that? If across the board, you know, in every single state, uh, and in every place where, where our people are concentrated, particularly in these urban and suburban areas, we see the same practices, the same approach, and the same results. You know, death, just straight up death, uh, or mass incarceration, or, or racial profiling, or stop and frisk by many various names, you know, that, that lead to all of these uh, 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 types of incidences. How do you explain that? You know, so you can't, it defeats this whole argument. You can't say, well, these are just kind of individual, it's random. Like, no, this is very systematic. It's intentional. Uh, and it's, it's part of the, the, not only the policy, but the very fabric of the, the kind of mindset and orientation around social control uh, that's being, you know, uh, uh, visited upon our people. Right. And, and one of, one of the, the things I really like about this report, as well as the last report, is that it was very solutions oriented. And, and, but this report has has you know almost an addendum has something that that is a report within a report it's it's the actual guide it's the handbook um, the handbook for for self defense can you talk about what this is and why you see this guide for self defense a critical uh, component within this report yeah the 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 let your model be resistance a, a handbook uh, that was put together by myself and some other comrades uh, within the Malcolm X grassroots movement we really wanted to be proactive. Uh, you know, there's a common pattern that you see in our communities as well. Uh, one of our loved ones is, is killed, uh, snuffed out in cold blood by the police, uh, often for doing absolutely nothing, uh, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and then there's a common pattern of, of us kind of resorting to uh, protests, demanding answers, uh, demanding, you know, typically from a lot of the families, I just want to know what happened, you know. Uh, at, at most, there's no criminal prosecution of the police at all, no investigation. They're kind of just taking off duty for a little bit, um, you know, uh, putting on a desk job for a couple of months, uh, and then they're right back on the street. Then people have to resort to civil lawsuits. Um, about half the time, people win something, you know, in terms of some kind of financial remuneration, but meanwhile, you know, uh, 300 of our people plus uh, are systematically being hunted and killed. So how do we be proactive in uh, changing how policing is done in our communities? You know, uh, how can we be proactive in addressing the intercommunal violence in our communities? Because uh, we don't think it's enough, and part of this pattern, you know, of just kind of waiting for a protest or waiting for something to happen and then kind of mobilizing. It's, it's really uh, too late. You know, uh, after the fact, it's, it's too late. We got to do things that, if we know the figures are as high as this every year, and we believe that they are, uh, again, you know, because I say that, that belief, because there is no, you know, the FBI and the U.S. government doesn't keep records like, like this, and they, they don't do so deliberately. 
But, uh, you know, we have to step up our role in uh, reorganizing our communities uh, to be able to defend ourselves and be able to, you know, uh, beat back uh, the repression that's being, uh, you know, meted out to us uh, by the government and, and many other forces. And, you know, uh, our ultimate objective is to see uh, black and oppressed communities uh, organized in this country to be able to exercise self-determination. I mean, that's that's what we're pushing for. Uh, but we, you know, it, it, we got to start where we are and start with the, the reality that we're dealing with. Uh, and the more that we are organized, and that's really what that, that Let Your Model really pushes, is that, you know, we got to start on our own blocks and our own communities and really, you know, get to know our neighbors, uh, get to know what their interests are, you know, where their politics lie, uh, what level of role are they, they're willing to, to uh, uh, play in terms of, you know, uh, Securing each other's back, you know, and and uh, just watching out for each other and watching out for our kids. It's it's not new, you know. These are the things that are really in that report. Quite frankly, uh, are tried and true methods that our communities uh, uh, used to practice extensively, uh, particularly in the South. Uh, so it was just really kind of refashioning it and representing a lot of that to a younger generation and saying, you know, we've done this in the past. Uh, we can do it again. You know, the, the know-how is there. Uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in many respects, if you, particularly if it goes to some of the older generations. Uh, so it's not something that's alien to us. We can do it, you know, but it's just going to take the will and resolve uh, to get out there and start doing the organizing. And from there, you know, build our capacity community by community to be able to ward this off. And once we're organized, we can more systematically deal with stop and frisk or these gang injunctions that, uh, uh or things that are more internal. How do we deal with, you know, uh, the underground economy? You know, in all its various aspects, you know, with an understanding and being humane that people got to eat. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we got to start tackling more economic questions that are plaguing our communities from, you know, unemployment, homelessness, joblessness, you know, foreclosed homes, all those things that are plaguing us. If we are organized, we are much, we are in a much stronger and it's more a sound position to deal with all of the different ails that confront us. So the self-defense is really one of many starting places that we really wanted to just, you know, put out. But uh, the other piece to it uh, is that we see this, this, you know, as the, the, the U.S. economy continues to tank, and that's what it's doing. The folks should they have no illusions about whatever Wall Street is doing. Yeah. You know, they can make profits without employing people these days, and, and, and that's really what the name of the game is. Uh, that, that that kind of paper economy is not tied to the real economy. The real economy, you know, the, one of the last reports that came out, what was like 88,000 uh, jobs were created. Yeah. Supposedly, who knows oftentimes what that means. But uh, uh, what it really spoke to was that roughly a couple of million people just have stopped showing up, yeah. you know, to, to, to the unemployment office saying I'm looking for work because yeah. they know ain't nothing there. That's right. Uh, but, you know, we got to tackle that. You know, and, and uh, I think start with a difficult challenge of, you know, how do we reorganize in our communities to, you know, uh, uh, meet our own needs and how do we fight against the repressive forces of, of both, you know, the corporations and capital and the state to, you know, uh, eliminate its grip and control over the resources that we all need to survive. So, um but we wanted to speak to this emergency and, and, and give us some urgency. So these these two pieces were put together to to work in that fashion to be solution oriented with the long some long term objectives in mind. The the, the the piece around Operation Ghetto Storm provides both some uh, you know we try to provide concrete uh, uh, material analysis and statistical breakdown yeah. so people are armed with with certain kind of facts put some analysis to it that, that, that reinforces and supports the organizing piece. And there's one more piece that we're going to come out with in, in May, uh, which is really for, for teachers, primarily on the high school and the, and the college level, but we think there's some material that everybody there can use, you know, for, for primary education as well. That's called uh, We Charge Genocide Again. So um, these three pieces we, we really want to push and, and, and move in, in tandem with uh, as, as kind of a guide you know, for the next couple of years that we hope 
you know, uh, black communities, Latino communities, oppressed communities throughout the, you know, the, the, the U.S. empire would pick up uh, and use, you know, whether there's somebody from MXG there to kind of work with and collaborate or not. Uh, that's not necessarily the point. The point is we need to get organized. And my last question, I thank you so much for, for taking the time uh, for this in-depth interview with us. Um, my last question for you, uh, Brother Callie, is, is almost a, a two-pronged question. I'm thinking totally out loud. And as I hear you explain uh, different aspects of the report, I'm just simply thinking that I think it would be vastly important for community centers, mosques, you know, churches, black churches, you know, to, to, to have folks come to actually, you know, um, break down this report and, and I would say even more importantly, break down the component of the report that you just kind of elaborated on, elaborated on and that's uh, what communities can do in terms of reorganizing themselves, coming together, uh, developing, you know, uh, uh, vertical economies, you know, that, that, that um, are based on a lot of things that you mentioned earlier in the, in the, uh, uh, the interview, you know, um, folks, you know, earning money, you know, looking after other folks' as kids and, and so forth. Um, what are the next steps that people that can t people can take? People that I, I undoubtedly are thinking out loud right now, saying, "Man, you know, I, man, I, I need to get a hold of this." Where can they go to get a hold of this report, get more mm -hmm. information about it? And also, um, a question I'd like to ask you is that: it, are, are members of Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, you know, including yourself, are you guys uh, available um, to come to community centers, black churches, mosques, and so forth to actually? break down colleges, universities, you know, schools to, to break down this report and actually to do workshops in terms of how we can actually tangibly reorganize ourselves as a community um, to kind of ward off everything from white supremacy, institutional racism, capitalism, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that question, number one. Um, you know, I think it helps us to, to promote uh, the organizing that we were talking about. Uh, first and foremost, people can get the report at uh, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement website, which is www.mxgm.org. Uh, currently, the Operation Ghetto Storm and Let Your Model Be Resistance are both up there for a free download. So, you know, download them, read them. It's a lot of paper. They're long. Uh, we, we understand that, but we think we wanted to give them the due attention that both these subjects needed. So we definitely encourage folks to read every single word, you know, not just kind of glance over, go on over in some detail and share. That's a practical thing, you know, uh, pass it along. Uh, you know, if you got questions, you got difference with it, that's fine. You know, uh, if you want to share those with us, uh, we are still looking to learn. We have by no means have any monopoly on knowledge around how to do this uh, uh, whatsoever. Uh, um, but, you know, we just put out some perspective and some concern in trying to, you know, put a fire under our, our own feet to, to move on this question. And in regards to people uh, doing trainings and being available for trainings, absolutely. Uh, myself and many other members in, in different chapters throughout the country uh, are preparing to really do a lot of training around this uh, in the spring, uh, you know, in various communities and uh, are looking to work at, you know, work with a number of different organizations uh, in the Black Left uh, Unity Network, the African Anti-War Front, uh, Etc. Uh, to doing some joint tandem to, you know, uh, uh, go into our communities, you know, be it a, a church of 500 or a gathering of five people, you know, from the community. Though size doesn't really matter, uh, but to really kind of go through this systematically, uh, um, you know, and share what information, knowledge, perspective that we have from from the experience of our organization has gained, particularly over the last 30 plus years. Uh, on how to deal with some of these questions and, and what lessons we have learned from, you know, trying to apply some of the stuff in Los Angeles, you know, around some of the gang truths, uh, or here in Atlanta where I'm, I'm currently based, you know, with some of the elders who've been here a long time if if, if uh, try to, you know, create kind of community, you know, dispute mechanisms and, and ways of solving internal contradictions and issues within the community. So there's a lot of experience that we could really touch on and share that we want to share. Uh, you know, to spread this out and have it be a movement. That's something that's intellectual property of, you know, uh, uh, our, our little organization, but something that people take up uh, and practice and, and put in a place that it moves us all forward to liberation. I appreciate that. I appreciate your time. And, and I, I look forward to having you back on in May to, to, um, to break down the next report that's coming out because I'm really looking forward to looking at that. And I think that's highly instructive and, and right on time and it's something that, that's critical and so I thank you and 
the rest of your, your comrades, the young men and, and women who are associated with Malcolm X grassroots movement uh, as uh, somebody that's, uh, you know, with your world news, you know, I can tell you unequivocally that we are in complete solidarity with uh, the work that you're doing with uh, Malcolm X grassroots movements and, and anything that we can do pressing forward, uh, let us know. And I hope people that are watching right now, please, you know, get a hold of this report and start to spread it, spread it, you know, send it through your, your emails, you know, download it as an attachment and send it out to everybody in your network, not just on Facebook, but throughout your 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 email networks and put in the subject header, you know, critical report, you know, 313 black people killed in 2012, uh, you know, and I think that should be enough for people to delve into that report. And and, uh, and if they do, uh, I think it's, it's a step in the right direction. So thank you so much. Uh, that's Calvin hey. Kuno of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. I'm Solomon Kamajan for Your World News. You've been watching Critical Insights. Peace. We're on East 229th here in the Wakefield section of the Bronx. Behind me, friends and family are gathered in front of the home that was that of Ramarley Graham. There are candles set up. The family and friends are still mourning 48 hours. And today, this afternoon, we finally got a look at the images of what exactly happened. The surveillance video is dramatic and telling. At 3 p.m. Thursday, 18-year-old Ramarley Graham can be seen walking into his home on East 229th in the Bronx. The NYPD rushes in seconds later without a search warrant and try to gain entry. And he's kicking the door because the door is locked. They came in with their gun drawn. According to a resident who was inside during the forced entry. They did not scream police. And there is no sign of a search warrant. The surveillance video is high grade. It's clarity that of a professional. Clearly the officers are seen desperately trying to break into the house through the front door. The damage evident once we got our cameras inside. The video also shows the NYPD entering through the back and then unlocking the front door. Once in, the race upstairs to Graham is on. And moments later, boom, boom, is all Paulette Minzy heard in her bathroom and barely dressed. She suddenly had a gun in her face. Minzy then put her hands up and screams, I'm the landlord, I'm the landlord. Minzy said the NYPD then searched her home. They found no gun on the second floor and unarmed Ramarley Graham was dead. After everything that's happened and the death of the young boy, the death of the young boy, how do you, how do you trust Police. I can't trust them. I'm scared of them. Right now, I'm scared of my life because I don't know what they will do. Because, you know, I don't know what they do. And if they saw me, I'm so scared. Do you think they're doing their job? No, they're not. They're not doing their job. They're not doing their job. They're cool. They're very cool. And I'm scared of my life because if the cops come and put a gun in my face, I'm so scared. And she's not the only one that is afraid. There are many people in this community who are on edge as well. We just had moments ago a car drive by here, and the drivers inside were actually cursing out the NYPD. This morning in Harlem, the Reverend Al Sharpton had a gathering. He said that he is not anti-police, nor is the entire community. They are against officers getting gunned down. They are also against unarmed teenagers getting gunned down. Reporting from the Wakefield section of the Bronx, Mario Diaz, PIX11 News. Kaidi. Thank you, Mario. The shooting over Marley Graham has police brutality watchdog groups stirred up. They say this most recent incident is just the latest in a string of tragic events that have been caused by what they call a policy of overstepping boundaries. Activists are calling on the mayor to re-examine police operations. Mayor Bloomberg now. Is this brother here who was beat by a police officer and thrown on his face right here in the Bronx too a few days ago? No weapon, no gun, no knife for a bag of marijuana. They say the Graham incident did not have to lead to a death. I got a letter from the government the other day. I opened and read it and burned that. Man, the way that I live don't concern that. Man, we gon' have to settle this another way. A letter from the government the other day.